Now let's take our Bibles tonight and turn to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. I'm going to pick up where we left off. Y'all pray for me tonight. Probably going to go in a lot of different places, so get ready to start turning your Bible in different places. All right, Daniel chapter 7. Read verse 9. It says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. And I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. And as concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And I saw in the night visions, <clears throat> and behold, one like the Son of Man came with clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory, a kingdom, and that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Let's pray. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd be with me as I stand before your congregation tonight. I pray that you'd help me to stand in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that you'd give me the correct interpretation here of these scriptures as I preach. And Lord, I pray that I not speak above anyone's head. Lord, you know my heart that I don't want to stand up here and just sound intelligent. I want people to understand uh, what the scripture says. So Lord, I pray that you'd help me to make them understand. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now we start out there with verse 9 where it says, I beheld till all thrones were cast down and the Ancient of Days did sit. That's a day when all the kingdoms of the earth are thrown down and the Lord takes over as the king of all the universe. When we, uh, the world once again will be under a theocracy, meaning God will rule and reign. See, the nations of the earth, the Bible says, are like dust in a balance to the Lord. They're counted as nothing and less than nothing. See, the Lord's going to blow all those kingdoms away and he's going to set up his everlasting throne. You say, when's he going to do this? Well, uh, we can read about it over in Revelation chapter 19. Uh, turn over there if you'd like or listen closely as I read it and comment a little bit on it. It says in verse 11 of Revelation 9, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. Now the heavens already opened about seven years prior. When the window of heaven opened, Jesus said, come up hither and he caught the church away up into the clouds. And we've been with the Lord for seven years. But at the end of that seven year period, he's going to come back and he's going to come back with ten thousands of his saints. Amen. And I'm going to be in that number. I'm going to be riding behind the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to go do battle. But you know what? I won't even have to raise my sword because he's going to do all the work. Amen. A sharp sword is going to proceed out of his mouth. And he's going to destroy his enemy with the brightness of his coming. And he's going to be riding on a white horse. As I preach through the book of Revelation a number of times when I come to that, that chapter and that verse, I always do this. I, I give you what the Greek is about the white horse so I can explain it to you better. The, the Greek word for white, the white horse uh, means in English white horse. So it's coming back on a white horse. You might say, are there horses in heaven? Evidently they are. And you know what? We'll be riding upon horses too. The armies that are in heaven are going to follow him upon white horses. You might say, I don't like horses. Well, maybe you don't, but you're going to be riding on one. But anyways, uh, he saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon that horse, it says, was called faithful and true. I like that. He's faithful. He said he's coming back. And you know what? He's going to. 
It talks about him coming back in the Old Testament. And he's going to come back. It talks about in, in Zechariah 14. His feet touching the Mount of Olives. And Mount of Olives it splitting in half. That's going to happen. He's faithful. And he's true. He's never spoken one falsehood in all of his existence. Or never will he. He's faithful. And he's true. And it says in righteousness he the judge and make war. Now I can't say that all wars are righteous. There's some very foolish wars, right? There's a lot of wars over things there shouldn't be wars over. And men certainly can't seem to get along, can they? But when Jesus comes back, he's making war in righteousness. He's going to set everything straight. He's going to put everybody in their place that's out of line. He's going to make the crooked straight. And he's going to have equity in it too. You certainly know in the dealings of men, everybody don't get their just due. But when Jesus comes, everything's going to be set justly. Amen? And I tell you what, I'm so glad he didn't deal with me in just, uh, justly because I would have went to hell, but he dealt with me in mercy and in grace. But when he comes back, he's dealing uh, with uh, in righteousness. It says his eyes were as a flame of fire. That means his anger is showing in his face. You can see it in his eyes. There's some people you can tell when they're angry. Because you can just see it in their eyes. I tell you what, I, I, I've had people tell me that I wouldn't make a good poker player. Because I have a lot of expression in my eyes. Well here Christ's eyes are bent in anger. Now when I think about the Lord. I think about how when he walked upon the earth. Nearly 2,000 years ago his eyes were a fountain of tears. He wept oftentimes over lost people. He looked over Jerusalem and he wept. He was moved with compassion when he looked upon the people he fed with the five loaves and two fishes. He constantly was moved with compassion. When he, when he heard that Lazarus was dead, of course he already knew. It says that Jesus wept. Why? Because Lazarus' sister's hearts were broken. But his eyes were a fountain of tears on earth. Uh, when he walked here among us, but now they're a flame of fire. He is coming back in wrath, and he's coming back in justice, and he's coming back in righteousness to make war. You say, who's he making war against? Well, the nations of the earth are going to rise up against Israel and against God, and he's going to come back. And you know what's going to happen? Just like it says in Daniel chapter 7, the thrones are all going to be thrown down. <clears throat> the Ancient of Days is going to sit. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to sit upon his throne. Amen. Amen. It says, his eyes were a flame of fire and his head were many crowns. I like that. I, I don't, uh, that, that shows, either shows all of his, his uh, parts that he's reigning over, but it may be as perchance some of those crowns that were cast before his feet, but there are many crowns upon his head. It says he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed in a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now, this word dip here means to be uh, drenched. It means to be uh, uh, soaked. It's where we get the word baptism. The word baptism comes from a word baptizo that's used to describe dyeing clothing. You'd take a, a white piece of linen and you'd thrust it down to what color you wanted it to be. And you'd soak it, you'd submerge it so the whole piece would be colored. Then, this here says that his vesture was dipped in blood. It means it was dyed red with the blood of his enemies. This is not representing his blood that was shed. This is the blood of those he's doing battle with. It says in one place in Revelation that the blood would flow to the horse's bridle in the valley of Armageddon. You'll see uh, early on in the book of Revelation that uh, he's clothed in a vesture, a white vesture, but here it's drenched in blood. I tell you what, you better come to the Lord Jesus Christ as your lamb. You better trust in His blood to wash away your sins or else He'll come as the Lion of the tribe of Judah and He'll tear you to pieces. You know, people's got a, un a biblical idea of who God is. They think He's just some old man upstairs. A lot of people have an idea. He's like George Burns. I always hated, I never saw any of those George Burns movies where he played God, but I tell you what, I would see like pictures of him. It just burned me up. But anyways... He's not just some old man in a rocking chair up there. He's the Almighty God. He's the Everlasting Father. 
He's the one who's going to judge the earth in righteousness. And it read, read about him coming back in Revelation 19 where his clothing, his vesture, is drenched in the blood of his enemies. He goes on to say, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's us. That's the saints of God. You say, how do you know, preacher? How do you know that's not talking about uh, angels coming? Well, angels are spirits. How are spirits going to do battle with flesh and blood in Armageddon? By the way, if you'll read early on that chapter, it says that the saints were clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And that's what these armies are clothed in. We're coming back with them. Does not the scripture say over and over again that we shall rule and reign with Christ? If we're going to rule and reign with him, we've got to come back with him. In the book of Jude, it says, the prophecy of Enoch says, the Lord cometh with who? Ten thousands of his saints. We're coming back with him. That's us. It says, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the wine press of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. Here's a vivid picture for you. Christ crushing his enemies is likened to uh, uh, someone treading the wine vat. You get all the grapes and put them into a, a big container, and people would take their shoes off. And I don't like the idea of this. But they'd get into that wine vat and they'd stomp those grapes and turn them into juice. Now I just, I don't know about that. I just don't want to drink something where people's feet have been in it. But I, I, what, what, you can if you want to. But that's the picture that, that we have here. Is Christ is crushing his enemies like somebody would crush those grapes underfoot. And what happens when you crush a grape? Out comes grape juice. Likewise is what it said early on in the book of Revelation that the blood flows to the horse's bridle. But anyways, going on to say, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. Now there's a contrast here. For those who have been born again, Saved by the grace of God, we will sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We'll sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we'll sit down with the Lord like the Lord said. He said, I'll not take of the fruit of the vine until I take it with you in my kingdom. We're going to sit at the Lord's table. We're going to have a spectacular supper. But right here, those who do not know God will be the supper. Not for the saints of God, but for the birds. I think I scared some of y'all for a minute. No, the birds are called to the great supper to feed on the flesh of kings and mighty men, those who fought against the Lord there in the valley of Armageddon on that day when all the thrones are cast down. It says, uh, come get, it says, I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. There's no difference, are they? That's why it says in one place, I can't remember where, in the Old Testament it says the rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. Do you know where the rich and the poor meet together? In the graveyard. They might have, once this one might have a fancier tombstone than the other, but they're both lying in the ground, the rich and the poor, and they've met together in that ne necropolis. But here we see uh, that all those who rejected Christ, no matter whether they were kings or mighty men or lowly, uh, or whether they be a bond, whether they be servants, or whether they be small or great, they're all destroyed. There was no quarter given to the presidents or to the kings. No, they were all destroyed. God is dealing here in justice. He's dealing here in anger. He's dealing here in righteousness. So he destroys all of his enemies. Let me ask you something. Do you want to be an enemy of God? I tell you, it blows my mind that somebody would want to be an enemy of God. Yet if you're not saved, that's just what you are. I remember many years ago, uh, some, some kids, uh, I allowed them to ride their skateboards there in our pavilion. And I said, as long as you don't tear nothing up, I guess you can do it. I was young and naive. <laughs> You know what happened? They tore it up. They beat the door in. It broke off of its hinges. The, the light switches were all broke off of the poles. And I said, uh, sorry, fellas, you can't ride no more. And that was really nice. 
But the next, next, uh, the, the next week, on our building dinners, they somebody spray painted "Fight the Power" on there. Now it didn't make me that mad. It really, it, it really was sad. Because I told my wife, I said, those kids don't realize what power they're fighting against. You're, well, you don't, don't pick a fight with the Almighty. I mean, I could get paint and paint right back over that. Some white paint's easy to put on. But don't pick a fight with the Almighty. And they were picking a fight, but I tell you, if you're not saved, you are already an enemy of God. You could be in this family by faith. You can be saved, but as long as you continue outside of the grace of God, you are His adversary. You know, you think the devil's the only adversary of God. No, the unbelieving world is. But I tell you, you'd have all men to be saved. But uh, this goes on to say in Revelation 19, we'll get back to Daniel here in a second. It says, I saw the beast... That's the little horn we read of last week. That's the Antichrist. And the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse. Once again, that Greek word for horse means horse. And against the army. And the beast was taken. And with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. And that and which deceived them uh, that had received the mark of the beast. And them uh, that worship the image and these were both cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone so that little horn that rises up against the Lord the Antichrist he's going to have a big mouth he's going to have a lot to say he's going to have the admiration of the whole world but when he tries to take on God God is going to destroy him with the brightness of his coming and he's going to be cast alive into the lake of fire. Amen. Along with a false prophet. We, he's not mentioned uh, uh, much in the book of Daniel. But there will be a, a, a false prophet. Which will be a, uh, the, the beast. The antichrist will be a political leader. And there will be a religious leader called the false prophet. And uh, uh, both of them will be cast alive in the lake of fire it says. And it goes on to say in uh, in. Uh, Revelation chapter 19, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat on the horse, and the sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and the fowls were filled with their flesh. What a sad picture we have there. But it didn't have to be this way. It didn't have to go this way. These people could have been saved. They could have been with that group that came from heaven. Everybody could have been saved, and we all could have rode victorious down to this earth. But yet they rejected Christ. Don't let that be your sad tale. Let me go to one more scripture here that has to do with the thrones being cast down. And I love this chapter. It's Psalm 2 if you want to turn over there. It says there, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The heathen are raging, speaking out the Gentile nations. It is the times of the Gentiles. They're raging. They're seen as four beasts here in the book of Daniel. These kingdoms of Gentile, Gentile powers. Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom of Babylon. The media Persia and the Persia Empire. The Grecian Empire with Alexander the Great. And the Roman Empire with all of its emperors and it's in its revived state. They rage. They're seen as wild beasts. They imagine a vain thing. You say, what's this vain thing they imagine? They, they, the magic thing they imagine is they can overcome the Almighty. I find it very strange that mankind think they can elevate themselves to Godhood. Yet there's many that even stand in pulpits today saying they are gods. We are not gods. We're children of God. But we're not gods. But they're going to try to overthrow the Almighty. These thrones are being set up. But God's going to just push them off, off the world just like somebody might push the chess pieces off of a chess board. It says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. 
The kings of the earth on their thrones speak to one another. Let's break away from religion. Let's break away from God. Let's break away from Christianity. All it's been to us is bands and cords. It's kept us from doing all the things we want to do. And what is it they want to do? Well, they want to revel in their own filth what they want to do. That's what they're doing today. They're trying to cast away Christ right now. Have you ever noticed uh, that they're all the time making fun of one deity that's uh, worshipped in this world? Yeah. Which deity is it that they, they're they all the time attacking? The real one. The Lord Jesus Christ. They dare not attack uh, Muhammad. They dare not attack uh, Buddha, the Buddha, or any of those other people. But they certainly do mock Christ, don't they? That tells me a lot. The world is raging against Christ. They want to cast away His cords. They want to do away with His Word. They want to do what they want to do. They don't care what He said about marriage. They don't care what He said about sodomy. They don't care. Let's cast away their cords. It says, let's break their bands asunder. Cast away their cords. And it says, he that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. The Lord is going to laugh, not because He thinks it funny. He's going to laugh to scorn at these people. What audacity does the creature have to rise up against the Creator? What chance do they have when their nations, not only the people that make up those nations, but the nations themselves are like the dust of a balance? He's going to knock down their thrones. It's like an ant setting up an ant hill, and I, I come over and I kick that ant hill away. The ants, they build back the ant hill. You know what I could do? I could go and kick that thing over every single day. It ain't no problem to me. God's going to kick them over like an ant hill. But when God kicks them over, they ain't going to rebuild. His throne is going to be built up and set up in its place. Daniel interpreted a dream very similar to this vision that he had where the stone rolled down the mountainside and hit the image that represented the kingdoms of men and it turned that image into dust and his stone that was cut out of their hands began to grow and filled the whole earth. His kingdom will have no end. It will stretch from shore to shore till sun and moon wax and wane no more. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. Then shall he speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his force or his pleasure. And he goes on to say, Yet I've set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. What king is that? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. The Father speaks to the Son and says, I'm going to set you on the throne. I declare the decree. He said, Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. That's them Gentiles. And the uttermost part of the earth uh, for thy possession. He's, he's not just going to reign on that little sliver of land over in Israel. He's going to rule over the whole world. Not only the whole world, but all of existence is his. He says, thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. That's what he's going to do. He's going to break the nations of the earth with a rod of iron. He's going to cast down their thrones. It's like a, a, somebody going into a, a, a place that makes pottery with a rod of iron and just hitting those pieces of pottery and destroying them and demolishing them with one swing. That's what he's going to do to the nations of the earth. He says, now, here's your advice. Be wise now. Be wise when? Now, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and ye perish in the way. When His wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are they that put their trust in Him. You're blessed if you trust Him. But I tell you, if you don't trust Him, it'll not go well for you. Huh? If you don't trust Him, it'll be hellfire for you. Let's get back to Daniel chapter 7 now. Back to, I believe it was verse 9, it says, And the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hairs of his head like pure wool. Now, who is this Ancient of Days that sat down after he's knocked down the thrones of this world? Well, it describes him, it says, that his garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. It was white. Well, we read the description of the resurrected Christ in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. Listen to the description of Christ. It says, And I was in the Spirit, talking about John, on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet, 
saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Of what thou seest, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, and Ephesus, and the Smyrna, and the Pergamos, and the Thyatira, and the Cyrus, and the Philadelphia, Sardis, and Philadelphia, and the Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks was one like to the Son of Man, clothed in a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps of the golden girdle, and his head and his hairs were white like what? Wool. As white as snow. And his eyes were a flame of fire. And his feet like in the brass as they burned in the furnace. And his voice is the sound of many waters. This is talking about Christ right here taking the throne. Christ is going to sit on the throne. It goes on to say uh, very much in accord with John chapter 1 where it says his feet were like fine brass as they burned in a furnace. It says here in Daniel chapter 7 verse 9 his throne was like to a fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. There's fire all around him. And that to a fire certainly is symbolic of judgment. His eyes were burning like a flame of fire. His throne was a flame of fire. And so were the wheels. Interesting enough, I'm not exactly sure what these wheels are in this text, but I do know in the book of Ezekiel uh, that there were wheels about the Lord and they were full of eyes. And these eyes, of course, are showing forth that God sees everything. If you know what a wheel is, it's circular. And if something is circular, you can see on all sides of it if you have eyes all around it, right? He sees everywhere. A lot of people think this may be describing a chariot. And of course the Lord could ride in a chariot. If he rides a horse, certainly he could ride a chariot. But anyways, verse 10. It says, I, The fiery stream issued forth and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered unto him. And ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And judgment was set. And the books were opened. So here we have Daniel seeing a picture of of the judgment seat and, and the great white throne judgment of, of Christ. He's going to cast down all the thrones. And sure there's other things that happen in between. Uh, but here he goes straight to, in his vision to the judgment. And we know that the judgment is set up for two different people. There's a judgment seat for believers. And there's the great white throne judgment for lost people. We read about that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. It says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick. What's the word quick mean? Alive. It's an old word. Quick. You're alive. So judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So there's two different people. There's two different times of judgment. The quick goes right along with his appearing. Us that are saved will be judged at his appearing. We'll not be judged for our sins. The Bible says that we will be judged to see what sort of works we had. Whether they be wood, hay, and stubble, or whether they be precious stones uh, and uh, precious metals. Now, quickly, I'll go over this. As we as believers stand before the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, our works will be tried to see what sort they are. Why, why did you do these works? Did you do these works for the applause of men? If you did those works for the applause of men, your works will be like wood, hay, and stubble as they pass through the fire. As they're judged, they will not be worthy of you being rewarded for them. They'll burn away. If your works were done because you loved Christ, they're like... Precious metal and precious stones, they pass through the fire. You will be rewarded for that. So we'll be, or we'll be rewarded. But I, primarily, I believe this is talking about the great white throne judgment. Simply because of this description of it uh, sounds like the great white throne judgment. It says the books were open. We read that same language in Revelation chapter 19. Listen to this. Revelation 19, 11, it says, I saw a great white throne. Look, that sounds similar to the throne that... that Daniel saw a fiery throne, white fire. And as I saw him that sat on it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Who is it that stood here? The dead. Remember I said the quick stand at the judgment seat of Christ to see what sort of work they had. 
The dead, uh, those who are dead in their trespass sins, stand before the great white throne judgment. That's at his kingdom. It says another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. These people are judged according to their works. The ones who are quick at the judgment of Christ, it's ju their works are judged to see what sort they are. Here the people are judged according to their works. Are you following me? It says, the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now we've talked about the beast and the false prophet being cast alive into the lake of fire. But I tell you what, your future will be the same if you reject Jesus Christ's so great salvation. You will be judged one day. Now if you die without Christ, you'll go straight to hell. You'll be held in hell until the Lord Jesus Christ calls uh, you up to stand before Him at the great white throne judgment. There you will be judged and then you will be cast in the lake of fire forever and ever. You say, well, I'll, I'll convince him to let me in. No, you won't. The books that will be open will have all the evidence that's needed to convict you. After all, if you're guilty in one point of the law, how many of the laws have you broken? You're guilty of all of them. Open up the books. Judge the court of works. I thought you fell short. Romans already told you that, by the way, didn't it? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You had every opportunity, but you didn't take it. And you weren't saved. And in verse 11, it says, I beheld, I beheld then because the voice of the great words which, were, which the horn spake. Now this horn is the Antichrist. We looked at the little horn a little bit. The Antichrist will come on the scene after the church is gone. And I'm going to go to one more portion of Scripture and we'll end with this one. But over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we can read a little bit more about the Antichrist, this little horn. It says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the gathering together unto him, that ye soon, not soon, be shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as the day of the Lord is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, evidently there were some forgeries going around. People claiming to be Paul right in the church. And there were a lot of people uh, giving out misinformation. Paul said, don't be shaken by all that. Some of them thought the Lord had already come back and left them behind. But Paul said, there'll be a great falling away first. Now this great falling away could be one of two things, according to most people who try to interpret it. I'll tell you them both, and you can make up your own mind, and I'll tell you which one I think it is. Some people think the great falling away is the rapture of the church. I don't believe that to be so. But you can believe that if you like, because the rapture of the church will take place before the Antichrist comes. But I believe the great falling away is the church falling away. And you can see how the church has fallen away from the truth. I mean, as soon as the first century church had really established itself, people were already starting to creep in unawares and trying to change good doctrine for bad doctrine. But I tell you what, it has increased over time. Evil seducers have waxed worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The Bible gives a long list of the last days, how they'd be perilous times. Men lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. All those things are multiplied in the last days and things are getting worse and worse. You can see the pattern there in the seven churches in Asia. And the last two churches that are mentioned are the church of Philadelphia and the last one was Laodicea, which was the worst. Laodicea, I believe, is a false church if you look at it as being the a, a, a church age. Church of Philadelphia uh, was a pretty true church, and then you moved into Laodicea, and I tell you what, it got lukewarm, and it got away from the Lord. But uh, that falling away, I believe, has already taken place. The Lord could come back at any time, by the way. But anyways, it goes on to say, 
Except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. The man of sin is going to be revealed when the church is gone. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit from this text, although there's many other texts I could use for this, uh, but we can see specifically here uh, that the church will be gone when this man of sin is revealed, this little horn that, has a, that speaks great things. Now, this is what the, the, uh, the, the little horn does, the Antichrist, it says. Except the come be fallen away first, and the man be, of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or is worshipped, so that God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. See, the Antichrist will come on the scene after the church is gone. He will uh, be a great politician. He'll gather together a ten-nation confederation. He will sign a treaty with Israel for seven years. But in the middle of that seven year period, three and a half years in, he's going to declare himself to be God. He's going to set up an image of himself in the temple that will be rebuilt. And this image will speak and move. And people call, he'll tell everybody they need to worship that image or die. Right? And he'll turn upon Israel, break that covenant, try to destroy them, and they'll have to flee to the mountains. And he'll try to waste the people, the people of God there. But God will save them and hold them in the mountains till we come back with him. Amen? Now, it goes on to say about this Antichrist. Uh, so that he, he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And know ye, ye not, know ye, and ye know that withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. All right, here, here's what it's talking about there. There is somebody that's withholding the spirit of the Antichrist from coming. You know who that is? That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is keeping the devil from going ahead and starting his plan. The Antichrist maybe has tried to rise up some in the past, but he has always been put down by he who letteth. He that withholds, he that restrains. Letteth means to restrain. That's the Holy Spirit. Now, when is the Holy Spirit taken away? Where does the Holy Spirit live? Let me ask you that question. Lives in here. When's the Holy Spirit taken away? When we're taught, caught up in the air. Holy Spirit indwells men and women who are saved during this age of grace. But when, after the rapture, Jesus comes back in the clouds and the rapture takes place, the Holy Spirit's going with us and He's not going to be restraining the Antichrist anymore. So the Antichrist is going to come on the scene. Does that make sense? Is that clear as mud to you? I hope so. It says, and, and it says, and then shall that wicked be revealed right after we're gone. And who shall, the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Notice that in them. I believe it's talking about demon possession in the last days. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now what that tells me is that if you heard the gospel while you were alive here upon earth. And you rejected that gospel. And you get left behind in the resurrection day, you will believe a lie. God will send you strong delusion. So I tell you, you better be saved today. You better come to Him now. I mean, read it for yourself. That's what it says. There's no way to get around it. I've read it over and over again. But that's what it says. If you rejected the gospel, you'll not hear it later. You'll be deceived. You might say, well, I'll get saved in the tribulation period. No, you won't. Not according to that. So why not be saved today? Why not kiss the Son, lest He be angry with you? Why not, instead of being a part of those thrones that are cast down, why not rule and reign with Christ Jesus by trusting Him as your personal Savior? Let's pray.